not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. Heavenly Father, thank you for being the strength and refuge in our lives. Thank you for being our ultimate counselor who never ceases to teach and guide us to know more about who you are. Thank you for being the source of life and exercising your loving compassion and mercy on us. Jesus, we recognize that we lead lives that are self-reliant and self-centered. We repent of the ways we did not exercise humility within our families, relationships, workplaces, and schools. We repent of the ways in which we have put ourselves first before others and of the times when we ignored your voice to exercise compassion on others like you had done for us countless times before. Lord, many, many of us often feel discouraged, uh, disheartened, and let down by the difficulties and challenges that come our way. I pray that you would encourage and uplift our souls. When our minds feel cluttered with the worries that the world imposes on us, we pray that you would grant peace in our hearts and allow us to increasingly trust in you all the more. Jesus, we pray over every single person in this sanctuary. You know them by name, and only you know what each person is going through. I pray that whether we are going through joyful or difficult times, that we would be able to end each, each day in thanksgiving. God, we pray over the India Missions team as they are getting equipped to share the good and complete love of Jesus Christ. Strengthen their minds and spirits so that they may not be swayed by the spiritual oppression during this time, throughout the trip and after, and continue to unite them as a team. And may we, as New Hope, be a community that is able to cover our brothers and sisters in prayer. Jesus, will you give renewed strength, life, and wisdom to our pastoral staff and other servant leaders, including our elders, deacons, and PAC group leaders and praise team. We pray specifically for Pastor Yah that he proclaim your message boldly without hesitation, and we pray for our hearts to be open to listen. Thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We may all be seated. So if you've been part of us with the sermon series, we are finally at James chapter 5, which is the last chapter of the letter. So after today's sermon, we actually only have one more sermon, and the sermon series is complete. Um, And James chapter 5, at this point, we are in the midst of all of the rebukes that James has just been unleashing upon his members. I know for some of us, it's been very uh, heavy-hearted. James hasn't been holding back any punches. But it's really, uh, I'm just really blessed because as much as it's heavy-hearted, I've been talking to many of you, especially the impact group leaders, uh, I truly see us experiencing true joy that as we are being rebuked by James, as God is calling us towards repentance, as he's reminding us of his holiness and our sinfulness, that's actually how we experience true joy in our Christian living. Um, However, today's passage is, the first part of the passage is the last part of James's rebuke, but that's really not the purpose of this passage. It's really a, a passage of encouragement, uh, and James is really trying to uplift his members. So let's take a look at that. Um, and what we're going to do is we're actually going to just answer uh, five questions um, for us to really dig into the text. And I guess... Okay. Yeah, so the first question is, what's the beef? Okay, so James, if you read the first six verses, James is hot, right? And if you feel like James hasn't been holding back any punches up until now, these verses that we're about to read, these are the harshest, the most hostile words that James has. And we have to ask ourselves, like, James, what's the beef? What is really making you so impassioned towards your members. So let's take a look at that, and that's the first question. And I'm just going to read this out for us, um, starting in chapter 5, verse 1.
Okay. So come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded. Their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh, eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. So James, again, not holding back any punches. We don't have to ask James. So James, what are you really trying to say? He is saying it, right, just as directly as, as possible. And James' last rebuke is specifically targeted towards the rich. And there must have been people who are very wealthy. And it makes us wonder, is it okay for us to be rich? Is being wealthy, is that a sin before God? And God, in in Christianity, riches and wealth is not a sin. However, what James highlights is the different type of attitudes that we have surrounding our money. Um, So one of the attitudes that James really wants to highlight is, you have laid up treasure in the last days. And the first attitude that James really wants to attack is not necessarily, are you rich or are you concerned about money? But are you idolizing your wealth? Are you enjoying your wealth so much to the point where you forget where these blessings are actually coming from? And that's why he continues in verse 4. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you have kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of the hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. And what we see is the first thing that James is warning people is, you can be rich. God may bless you with great wealth. And that's a wonderful thing that all of us should celebrate. But be careful because in the midst of your riches, in the midst of your wealth, if you idolize that, If you're so preoccupied, so focused on the blessings to the point where you forget about the blesser, then this rebuke may be applicable to you. Are we idolizing our wealth? And the second thing that James actually attacks and really tries to identify is not so much are you idolizing your wealth, but how are you accumulating your wealth? Are you accumulating your wealth at the expense of other people? And that's the reason why James says in verse 4, The wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, the rich people's fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. And what James is saying is a lot of these wealthy people, a lot of these rich people, how do they actually accumulate their wealth? It's not through hard-earned living. It's not through, you know, just really good work ethic. But they accumulated their wealth at the expense of other people. And that's the reason why he's saying the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the second thing that we have to be careful of is as we accumulate our wealth, and yeah, I I want us to pray prayers of blessing that God can establish all of us in our careers, that God will continue to provide for us, and those are godly things. But A, how are you accumulating that wealth? I think most of us, we probably work in, you know, pretty, like, ethical jobs. But more fundamentally is, how sensitive are we to those who are being marginalized? How sensitive are we to the laborers who are not able to actually get what they're due? Uh, All of us, well, not all of us, but many of us, we are going to be very well established in our careers. Uh, hopefully, even at the zenith of your career, even at the height of your establishment, I hope many of us can still have a heart that is very sensitive to those who are not as privileged. Um, and how do we do those type of things? How do we tr- make, our sh- make sure that we're not idolizing wealth and at the same time being sensitive to those people who are marginalized? And it's actually not that difficult. Um, There are very creative ways of doing this. For instance, even in my family, Jeannie and myself, uh, we have three kids. And one of the things that we wanted to do is before they were born, or actually before their first birthday, we wanted to adopt a twin sibling for every one of our siblings. So for instance, Jude, his birthday is September 24th. 
And then as we approach his first birthday, what we tried to do was we tried to find like a compassion child. I mean, there are so many agencies and organizations out there, but we wanted to find a child who had the same exact birthday, September 24, as Jude. Because the idea was during every time there's a birthday celebration for Jude, every time there's a Christmas celebration, we remind Jude, you know, we have sponsored your twin sibling. We're not only giving this person money, but this person doesn't get nearly as much blessings, material wealth as you do. And we would give him, you know, birthday gifts from, you know, the different parties. And we would ask him, should we take some of your birthday gifts and should we donate it to your twin sibling? And small creative ways like that, what we're trying to do is instilling in our children, even though they're going to grow up in wealth, they're going to grow up never having to worry about whether or not they're going to eat dinner. But small things like that, they're able to realize, you know what, there's somebody in the world who is just like me, who is exactly my age, same exact birthday, and unfortunately that person isn't able to have this type of, these privileges. Little things like that remind us to not idolize our wealth, but to actually utilize our wealth in ways that may actually glorify and honor God. And again, it's not that difficult. So for instance, I've been sharing with you guys about Lisa. And it's really cool what God is doing because not only in Lisa's heart, and she is um, a person who is standing at the exit uh, whenever I get off um, the highway onto Bayview. And she has a sign saying, you know what, I, I don't have... Uh, I don't have, I forget what the sign says, but she says, I have three young boys I'm trying to feed. I don't think she has um, like a steady job that's sufficient to be able to pay for all of her expenses. And we've been giving her like granola bars, those type of things. Uh, But we really wanted to take it a a notch up, especially with James chapter 2 about don't just bless people, but actually give them clothing. And what my wife Jeannie has been doing is through Facebook, there is a mommy's group in our Oakville area. And she's been telling people, you know, there is a a lady named Lisa that we see every single Sunday. And we would love to be able to give her more items, donations. And And then a lot of these moms, what they do is they send Jeannie the address of their house. And they say, come by my house. I'm going to leave out a trash bag of things that you can donate to Lisa. And this morning, over the weekend... Some, some random family, they actually donated, like, brand new jackets, brand new winter jackets for boys. You know, you see the tag. So we gave that to Lisa. I gave her, like, our business card, the Uptown business card, telling her about our Christmas luncheon that's going to come up, if she wants a free meal, these different things. And these are very simple ways where we can remember those people who are marginalized. And really, like, I think it's a great blessing to the people that we try to love, But in reality, it's actually blessing us. Because like I mentioned, with wealth, with no money, no problems, all these different things, it's very elusive. But for us to continually do these little, like, practices like this, it actually helps us to not idolize our wealth and to also be really empathetic, sensitive to those who are being marginalized. Now, James has these really harsh words, right? And what happens to those people who are idolizing their wealth? James says, the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. And I have that underlined for a reason. So all the cries of the people who are being marginalized, the homeless, the widows, the orphans, all these things, our God not only hears, but what James, the way he describes God is the Lord of hosts. When was the last time you heard somebody pray to God and they prayed, Oh, Lord of hosts, won't you bless us this morning? It's probably been a long time. It's a very uncommon way of addressing God. What does Lord of hosts mean? Lord of hosts basically means that there is a host of armies. And when people in the Bible say the Lord of hosts, what they're saying is, yes, God is a loving father. Truly he is. But God is also seen as that military general. And when this military general comes at your door, when he's coming after you, he is, he means business. He has a host of armies. And let me just provide just some examples of this. So for instance, these two verses are very helpful. 
Then the, this is all the way back in Genesis chapter 18. Then the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down. And this is very similar to what we read in James. The outcry of the harvesters, the outcry of the laborers. God is hearing the Lord of hosts. And in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 9, it says, If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. And I know not everybody has grown up in the church, so Sodom and Gomorrah, you may wonder, what is that? But even in, you know, slang terms, Sodom and Gomorrah, there is some meaning. And the biblical story is Sodom and Gomorrah was just an absolutely wicked, wicked city. And God, because of the wickedness, God sent angels to judge this city. And when the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, when they saw these angels who looked like humans, when they saw them, what they wanted to do was they wanted to rape them sexually. However, there is one person in Sodom and Gomorrah who was a righteous person. His, his name was Lot. He was the nephew of Abraham. He lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. And he saw these two angels, these messengers, and he recognized, oh, they, they don't look like they're from around here. And he's frightened. He's like, hey, you two, you come to my house. Things are not going to go well. And then the next thing you know, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, the entire city, they are pounding at the door of Lot's house. And they said, hey, Lot, I know that you have these two foreigners, please allow us to be able to have sexual intercourse with them. And such a wicked city, and you can look at this yourself in Genesis chapter 18, and what ends up happening, just to make a long story short, is when God confronts this wicked city, Sodom and Gomorrah, he doesn't come like a loving father, like an intimate father. He comes like the Lord of hosts. He is the commander of the heavenly hosts, and he's not coming by himself, but he's coming with a host of armies. And that's the picture that James has. And what James is saying, you rich people who are idolizing your wealth, you rich people who are just completely insensitive to those who are underprivileged, if you continue to do this, the cries of the laborers, the cries of the harvesters, the Lord of hosts will listen, and he is coming after you. Now, it's very likely that the people that James is addressing in the verses that we read are not people part of James's church. It's most likely that the people in James's church are actually not the rich people, but the people who are harvesting, who are laboring at the expense of the rich people. Uh, most likely in James's church, these are the people who felt like they were marginalized. They were the ones who are working their tails off. They are the ones who are picking up extra shifts, all these different things. But they themselves are being abused by the wealthy people. And the reason why James's language is so harsh is because what he is trying to encourage his members who feel like they are just being abused by the system, he's trying to encourage them, don't worry, there, our God is a judge. And he'll make everything right. You don't have to be bitter or resentful to your managers, to all these wealth people who are taking advantage of you, because our God, he's going to take care of this. Don't take matters into your own hands, because leave them and surrender them into God's hands, because he is that perfect judge. He knows and he hears all of your cries. And that leads us to really the second question, is what's the beef? James has beef with people who are idolizing their wealth at the expense of those who are marginalized, who are underprivileged. So what is the point of this passage? What is the point of James chapter 5? The point is, ultimately, not to rebuke the rich people, but James's purpose in, in writing this is to encourage his members because they're being abused by the rich people. He's encouraging them to be patient. So let's take a look at this as well. So starting in verse 7, that's why it says, Be patient, therefore, brothers. And for the first time, he's now addressing brothers, sisters, people who are within his congregation. Uh, Until the coming of the Lord, see the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And whenever you're reading the Bible, and just, just a tip, 
to help you read the Bible in a way that's more meaningful, is if there's ever words or concepts that are repeated, such as in this passage, being patient, that means there's something important about this. So let's continue on in verse 9. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. And again, being steadfast is the same thing as being patient. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So basically, the point of this passage is not necessarily James rebuking those who are idolized wealth. What James, the point of this passage is there are many people who feel like there's injustice in the world. There are many people who feel like, you know what, their life is not fair. They can never catch a break. And James is saying, be patient, be steadfast. Because our God, he hears all of your griefs. He hears all of your moan, all of your groaning, all the things that are aching your heart. And trust me, this God is not just some God who is powerless. This is the Lord of hosts. And he is coming. He is at your door. I don't know how um, all of our lives are like. I know for some of us, life is groovy. Like you're loving it. Everything is just falling into place. Everything is just going according to plan. But for the majority of us, life doesn't feel fair. For many of us, I know life is difficult. And for people who are experiencing that type of, man, God, why can I never catch a break? or I'm trying so hard, I'm spinning my wheels, but nothing ever turns my way, this passage is so relevant to you because what James is saying is be patient, endure, be steadfast. All those closed doors, they're not by accident. God, I know it sounds cruel. I know it sounds like it's really just tough love. God is trying to grow your patience. God is trying to grow your steadfastness through these difficult times. He hears every single one of your prayers. He sees every single time your heart drops because you feel so discouraged. What James is saying, he notices all of that. Don't discount the fact that our God, all the cries, all the complaints, they reach the ears of our Heavenly Father. So that is really the point of the message. Um, However, it gets more encouraging Uh, So let's turn to the third part of the sermon. Not only what is the beef, what is James so riled up about, what is the point is to encourage us to be patient, to wait on the Lord, that he is trustworthy. But does God come in peace is the next question. Because what we read earlier is God is portrayed as the Lord of hosts. And then another verse that we just read, God is portrayed not as an intimate father, but he's portrayed as the judge who is standing at the door. Does God come in peace? Or is he coming, like the title of the sermon says, is he just militant? Is he coming to start a war? Um, So let's take a look at this. Actually, if you have your Bibles, um, there's just something that is really difficult to portray through the slides. If you have your Bibles or even your Bible apps, then please follow along with me because it's it's really neat to see how James describes not only who God is, but the movement of God in this passage. So James chapter 5, and starting in the end of verse 4, if you can read along with me, James chapter 5, starting at the end of verse 4, what we see is, God hears the cries of the harvesters and God is portrayed as that militant God, the Lord of hosts. God in some ways is a little distant at the end of verse 4, right? But if you go to verse 7, what you see is, be patient therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. So from verse 4 to verse 7, what we see is we see a God, the Lord of hosts. He is militant, all power, right? Fearsome. He hears, and now in verse 7, there's movement. Now he's coming. He hears our cries. He hears our prayers, and now he's coming. Now if we skip forward to 
verse 8, at the end of verse 8, now it's not a matter of, is the Lord coming? It says the coming of the Lord is at hand. He is very, very close to us now. There is movement. First, he has to hear our prayers. Now he's coming. And now his coming is at hand. It's like he's right there. And then if you look at verse 9, it says the judge, at the end of verse 9, is standing at the door. What we see is there's movement. Where as we pray, God hears our prayers. As we pray, God comes to us. That coming is at hand. To the point where he is right at our door. And when we open this door, what do we get? Do we get the Lord of hosts who is militant, who is breathing down our necks? Do we get the judge where it says in verse 9 where he is going to look at everything that we've done, every thought, every whatever? What we get when we open the door, James talks about in verse 11, at the end of verse 11. And you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. For those who are praying humbly, saying, God, I don't have my life figured out. Or man, God, over the past year, I'm just spinning my wheels. He will come for sure. But he's not going to come as a Lord of hosts. He's not going to come as that judge whom we should fear. When he's at your door and when you open that door, what does James say? This God is full of compassion and mercy. He knows exactly what you're going through. You know, last week when I said, is God a helicopter parent? No, he's not. Because although he is so present in our lives, he is so emotionally empathetic. He knows exactly how our hearts feel. And when he comes, comes to us, yes, he is holy. I don't want us to ever neglect that. But when we are broken and we are just at our wit's end, what God shows us is not his holiness. He shows us his compassion and his mercy. He says, I understand exactly what you are going through. That's the reason why I had to send my son to walk through your shoes, to suffer in this world that is broken. So that I don't just theoretically say, yeah, I understand what you're going through, but I lived it myself. So when we think about a God like this, who is not only compassionate and merciful, but he is the Lord of hosts, he is powerful He is just, he is the judge who's going to make all things right, and yet he is on your side, yet he is compassionate towards you, yet he is merciful towards you. How uplifting is that? How that changes the way we look at our lives. Uh, I know, for instance, um, how many of us are like between cat people and dog people? How many of us are dog people? Yes, I'm a dog person as well. I love dogs. Um, if you love cats, and that's fine. I mean, we're still brothers and sisters in Christ. But I love dogs because they, they are so loyal. In some ways, they feel so compassionate. Like they're just there. They listen to everything that you say, all of your heartaches. It's not like I talk to my dog. I don't have a dog, okay? I'm just saying this hypothetically. Um, but with a cat, you start like pouring out your heart to a cat. She yawns, or I don't don't know why I personified it as a she, but the cat yawns, the cat is bored with you, but for a dog, he or she is just content, just lying down in your lap, and you can just pour out your soul. And as therapeutic as that is, the dog can't really change anything. The dog is not the dog of hosts. The dog can't really help you in your gripes. But what we have is, I'm not trying to make God look like a pet dog, But in some ways, we have a God who empathizes, who is so loyal, who is so compassionate. He's not going to yawn when you are pouring out your soul. He's not going to ask you, where is my bowl of milk? Our God is there, so compassionate, so merciful. That's not it, though. He is also the Lord of hosts. He is powerful. He can do things. He can change your life. As you pray, he responds to that. And when we have those two things together, the Lord of hosts who is judge, who has all the resources at the, at the tips of his fingers, and at the same time he is so compassionate, so merciful, 
What kind of God is that? It's amazing. So what do we do with that? What do we do with a God like that? And that's where we go on to the fourth question of our passage. And for James, it may seem a little left field, a little random, but the first thing that James says, if you truly understand this God who is so powerful but at the same time so compassionate, the first thing that James addresses is, but what about him or her? What about that person who is just so annoying, who just drives me crazy? And that's the reason why it sounds very random. In verse 9, James says, Do not grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, so that you may, be, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And one very practical implication, if we have the Lord of hosts who is on our side, who wants to give us compassion and mercy, then the first thing that James is saying that that should change and affect is your relationships with your brothers and sisters. Now, earlier I said we are the body of Christ, and I know that sounds so poetic, all that stuff. We all feel so great. We want to sing Kumbaya around the fireplace. But part of being part of the body of Christ is there are going to be moments where you want to grumble against one another. There are going to be moments, even though we are brothers and sisters in Christ, there are going to be moments where our personalities conflict. We're all still sinners. We're going to hurt each other. All these different things. And what James is saying is, yes, it's very difficult. And there are going to be times when you want to grumble against one another. But if you know that the Lord of hosts hears and sees everything, and if you have experienced this God who is so compassionate and merciful to you, then that means don't grumble against your brothers and sisters. Instead, be an agent of love to your brothers and sisters. And I know for some of us, like I mentioned, some of us, life is great. It's peaches and cream. And you're not experiencing that kind of injustice, that kind of confusion in your life. If that's the case, then you need to, if you truly know this Lord of hosts who is so compassionate and merciful to you, in what ways can you be an agent? Can you be empathetic? Can you be sensitive to your fellow brothers and sisters who are experiencing heartaches, who are going through difficult times? So for James, the first thing is, the first practical implication is, if we truly understand this vertical understanding of God, then it should drastically transform the way we love one another. Um, the last thing that James talks about, and we're going to skip through a few slides. So, so just to recap, what's the beef? James is saying there are rich people who are idolizing their wealth, and they could care less about people who are being marginalized. But the purpose of this, this passage is really to encourage his congregation members who are going through difficulties, he's saying, be patient, be steadfast, look to Job, look at the prophets, be patient. But the reason why we can be patient is because we have a God who is not only all-powerful, but so compassionate and so merciful to us. And the first practical implication is that means to that person that we want to grumble against, we're not going to grumble. And instead, we're going to be agents of love to one another. And the last thing that we're going to cover that James talks about is if this God is truly the Lord of hosts, but yet he is compassionate and merciful, then the last thing that it actually affects in our practical daily living is, but what about my pain? Some of us are still experiencing pain. And how do we cope with this? In our everyday life, what does this actually look like? So here I want to close with this verse. That is in our passage. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And what I really want to hear it, highlight is, you have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. I was very encouraged by Brother Terry this morning, where he shared with us the book of Job. Book of Job is a tough cookie. That is, yeah. I mean, it's part of the Bible. You still see the gospel. You still see God's love there. But it's, it's a difficult book. I mean, how many of us have read the book of Job or studied it or heard of it? Okay. Um, and for those, those of us who don't know what that is, the book of Job, basically the story, as Terry kind of mentioned, is 
we see Job who is like the person that everybody wants to be. You know that saying? Uh, I won't go with that saying. But anyway, he is the model person. Every guy wants to be like him. Every girl wants to be with him. That type of guy, right? Blameless, like just upright. He has a lot of kids, a lot of wealth, a lot of workers, a lot of resources. But God takes all that away. And in the story of Job, God is so righteous. He's so worthy of our, our worship. But what's funny is, if you read that book carefully, you don't really see God being compassionate or merciful. And I encourage all of us to read that book carefully. What you see is you see God being like holy, worthy of worship. And basically when he confronts Job, he doesn't pat Job on the shoulder saying, oh, I feel bad for you, Job. Yeah, that was, that's, that's tough, tough loss. But what he does is, Job, who is it who created this universe? Who is it that is able to make this universe maintain itself? It's me. And who do you think you are to not be able to worship me even in the midst of this heartache that you're experiencing? Th that's the story of Job. You don't really see the compassion. You don't really see the mercy of God. And obviously the compassion and mercy of God is still there. But that's not what the story of Job is known for. But yet, when James comforts his people, he not only talks about the story of Job, but he connects that with the idea that God notices. He sees everything, and he's compassionate and merciful to you. Why would he pick Job out of all the stories? I mean, if I'm struggling, and if somebody said, don't worry, God is going to work in your life in the same way that God worked in Job's life. I'm scared. I'm like hugging my kids. I'm hugging. Like, I don't want God to do that to me. Why would James bring up Job? And it reminds me of a time where Jude, my oldest son, I don't even think he was a year old. I think he was about nine months old. And Jeannie and I were at a hotel uh, for some conference. And, you know, if you're cooped up in a hotel room, there's not much for a nine-month-old to do. He's crawling around. He's very active. And one thing that he really wanted to do, for whatever reason, is he crawled to the stroller, and he wanted to play with the wheel of the stroller. And I did, no, shoot, you can't do that, because the wheel of the stroller is just filthy. I mean, just think about strolling through streets, sidewalks, all these different things. You might stroll over, like, dog poop, like, dog urine. Like, who knows, like, where that wheel has been. So I'm like, Jude, you cannot do that. And the way Jude responded is still in my mind is he's, like, in agony. Because he, he, he knows like, I'm the father of hosts, and I need, I need to listen to my dad. But at the same time, he wants to touch that wheel for whatever reason. And the picture is, he's, like, crying, like, his face is in agony, but his hand is right at the wheel. But he's not touching it. And he wants so badly to touch the wheel. And I'm like, that's really weird. Like, I, I don't know what's going through his mind, um, but I just kind of move on. I'm just thinking, you know what? Like, even as a nine-month-old, he needs to learn obedience. He needs to learn what's right and what's wrong. And I didn't really think much of it until about a week or two later, we went to one of those mu children's museums that are just designed for kids. And in these museums, there are so many exhibits for kids to do, like, fake grocery shopping, fake gardening, all these different things. So many things that kids get excited about. But do you know what Joe, uh, not Joe, <laughs> do you know what Jude was doing the entire time? There was this one in the corner that no kid was paying attention to. There was like a wheel. And all he was doing was spinning that wheel. Like literally for an hour. When we have play dates with other people, and they're like, oh, you know what, uh, we would love to have you over, but you know, our place, we don't really have many toys. We're like, oh, it's fine, we'll, we'll figure it out. So we go to their house, and we're wondering, oh, Jude is going to be so bored. All he needed was just one car, and he just literally spinning the wheels. And after thinking about that, I realized at that hotel room, when I said no, it wasn't just, okay, I won't do this. Every fiber of his being, whatever it is during his development phase, 
that wheel was so important for him. But what was more important was, I need to listen to my daddy. Um, the reason why I share this is because, and I know one day Jude will probably, like in this day in technology, he's going to listen to all these sermons. So I'm like, first of all, sorry, Jude. <laughs> Jude, like I mentioned earlier, very talented boy. Like I mentioned earlier, he rocked the IQ tests. I've seen him piano recitals. I've seen him do a lot of things that a lot of parents would say, I'm so proud of you. All those things, I could care less. When I think about Jude, and when I think about my pride and my love for him, I think about him as a nine-month-old, wanting so desperately to touch that wheel, but he doesn't. And the funny thing is, the reason why this is relevant to this passage is because if you ask Jude, Jude, does your daddy love you? Is your daddy proud of you? He would never, ever, ever think of that moment. So insignificant. He probably doesn't even rem- I hope he doesn't remember it. <laughs> he probably doesn't even remember it. That is the way it is with our Heavenly Father. So interesting. If you read Job carefully, and I would love to do a sermon series on this, Job never knows that God is so proud of Job. When is God proud of Job? He boasts about Job to the angels, to Satan. He says, Satan, have you considered Job? He is amazing. There is no guy like him. Job never sees any of that. And for Job, when God thinks about Job, it's that innocent prayer that maybe Job never thinks is all that spectacular. The Lord has given, he has taken away. Praise be to God. That little thing that for Job, he may think nobody notices, our Heavenly Father notices that. And not only does he notice that, he remembers that. And it doesn't matter how many times you failed. It doesn't matter how many times Jude fails. I will always, always remember that day where he did not touch that wheel. It seems so insignificant. And even me saying it out loud, I feel like it's kind of silly. But the silliness is on purpose because the silly moments in your life do not underestimate. Our God hears your cries. Our God knows it. When you cry yourself to sleep, our God knows that when you wake up, all you are thinking about is all the anxiety that is just overwhelming your mind. God notices when you look at yourself in the mirror, you're wondering, I am such a failure. He notices all those things and that one little act of faith, even though it may not seem significant, you're just not touching that dirty stroller wheel. God remembers. Trust me. Our Heavenly Father, it says it right here. He sees our pain. And when he comes to our door, yes, he is a Lord of hosts. Yes, his army is fully stocked behind him. Yes, he is that righteous judge. But James says he comes with compassion and mercy. He loves every single one of us so dearly. He loves us. He knows us. This is a God who is worthy of our worship. Uh, You know, so as we wrap up, uh, I just want all of us to rise. And if the rest of the band can come forward. Who is this God? How do you perceive our God? Is he some distant God that you have to cry really loud for to reach his ears? Or is it a God who is on the move? He has not only heard, he is not only coming, his coming is at hand. His coming is not only at hand, he is standing at the door. He is not only at the door, but he just wants to lavish, overwhelm you with his compassion and mercy. And no, he is not like that pet dog who just makes you feel warm and fuzzy. This God, when he gives you your, his compassion and mercy, it's not just empty words. This God is the Lord of hosts. His power is beyond all measure. This God is on your side.
And for many of us, we may never know what is that defining moment like Jude not touching a stroller. We may never know what that is. But there is one moment that we, every single one of us, can take to the bank. There is one moment that God thinks about every single time he sees you. And that is the moment where our Lord Jesus Christ not only hung on that cross, not only shed that blood, but he poured his blood over every single one of us. And when God sees us, he doesn't just see our failures. What he primarily sees is the blood that has covered over you. And if you're covered over the blood, he looks at you the same way that he looks at Jesus Christ. He doesn't look at you in the same way that he sees Moses or David, as heroic as they are. He sees you as he sees Jesus Christ, the exact imprint and representation of the glory of God. That is how God perceives us. When we think about that, yes, our sufferings are difficult, but doesn't that enable us to be a little bit more patient and steadfast? Yes, our relationships may feel chaotic, but doesn't that enable us just a little bit more to not only not grumble, but to actually be an agent of love? So I want us to spend some time, just really reflect upon that. How is the Spirit speaking to you this morning? Respond. He is not only at the door, but he is so compassionate and merciful.